currently going through a series called Disciple, looking at what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. It's more than just learning, it's more than just reading your Bible, it's more than simply accessing discipleship courses. It's about being who God's called us to be upon the earth. And we've looked at God calling us to be witnesses, a disciple is a witness about who Jesus is, about what he's done, what he's said and what you've seen. And today we're going to look at, at being ambassadors for Jesus. And when you think of an ambassador, you might think of, say, a political ambassador. You might have seen in the news recently that the ambassador for Israel on Sky News representing her country. That's what we see ambassadors as doing. But a Christian ambassador or an ambassador for Christ is, is, is much more than that. It's more than simply being a, a spokesperson for a country or another country. And I want to root what we're going to teach today or what I'm going to teach today in 2 Corinthians. If you want to turn there, it's chapter 5. And what I'd like to do at the back, on the back of it as well is, is do a bit of ministry, see what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He wants to bring freedom, wants to set us free. And so we want to be open to the Spirit as well today. So let me pray while you're turning to 2 Corinthians 5. So Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And I pray that today, Lord, you would guide us into all truth. We ask your Holy Spirit to come and, and, and lead us into the things of Jesus, that you would lead us into freedom. You would lead us into a greater sense of identity of who we are in you. Lord, that you'd remove any religiosity, any mindsets in us that restrict your spirit and keep us content and contained. And we ask God for the freedom of of your spirit through the power of your word in Jesus name. Amen. So 2 Corinthians 5 17 to 21. Therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so the Greek word that is used here for ambassadors isn't like a, a political ambassador. There's another word for that. This is about someone who is a mature and trusted representative of somebody else. It's like, it's like a right-hand man being sent to present the person who has sent you. And so as Christians, we're not representing heaven. We're not representing a kingdom as such. We are representing the king of that kingdom. That we come in the name of Jesus. That's what in the name of Jesus means. It's not some magic incantation where we can pray something and we just add in the name of Jesus to the back of it to give it some oomph. Now it's going to work. Now the in the name of Jesus means now we come in his authority. We come in his name and represent him. We are positioned in him and so carry his authority. That's why our prayers have authority. That's why when we pray for the sick, we can believe for healing because we move in the authority that the king of the kingdom has given us. We might not feel like it, but we are mature representatives of Jesus upon the earth. We are it. Have a look around. This is it in this place anyway. We are the representatives of Jesus upon the earth. You are an ambassador for Christ, whether you like it or not. That's what he said you are. And as representatives of Jesus, we represent him. We show him again to the world around us by how we live, by the words that we say, by the way that we demonstrate the kingdom through acts of love, mercy and compassion. But we also demonstrate it through a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we want to pursue the spiritual gifts. We want to move in words of knowledge. 
in the prophetic. We want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover because we represent the Jesus of the kingdom who did those things in the first place. You're his representative for others to get to know him. You're it. I'm it. Together we're it. We represent the king of the kingdom and the message of the kingdom. And so let's just unpack 2 Corinthians 5 a little bit more just to kind of develop this. And so it started off by saying, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So when we give our lives to Jesus, when we turn our hearts to him in repentance, when we lay our lives down and say, Jesus, you're Lord, you're King, you're my Saviour, you're my friend, but you're also my master. I'm now your slave, as it were, a slave to your righteousness, a bondservant, one who chooses to enslave himself to another. That's what Christ demands of us, that we actually now belong to him. The scriptures teach us that we're no longer our own. Our bodies aren't ours. They belong to Jesus. They've been bought. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus. He is our Lord. And the old us has gone away. Kind of. We, some people use that scripture to say, actually, I don't struggle with the old stuff. All the demonic's gone out of my life because I'm a new creation. The old has gone. Yet their attitudes don't change. They still have the same struggles. They still see the demonic strongholds working in their lives, yet they're deluded to say, I'm a new creation. It's all done at the cross, which it is, but it needs applying to your life. And as Christians, we can be locked in bondages. We can have paths in our life that become prisons because we don't realise that actually we need to do business with Jesus and the Spirit in our lives. When we come to faith, he begins a good work in us. And that work is making us more like Jesus. And so what are we doing with it? We are a new creation. The old has passed away, but the old stuff still needs dealing with a lot of the time. Can anyone recognise that in their life? I certainly can. And the thing is that God is the potter and we are the clay. We, We get saved and we then are back on the potter's wheel, allowing the Lord to shape us. And sometimes he gets his fingers right in our lives. And it can be painful. It can be exposing, but it's to shape us. It's to heal us, it's to make us more like him. Because on that potter's wheel, what God is doing is making you look like Jesus. You're not becoming a unique pot. This is you, this is my truth, this is me, God loves me as I am. Yes, he does, but he wants you to be like Jesus. That was a design all along. Adam, I believe, was created to be like Jesus, to look like Jesus, to represent Jesus to the world. But he fell. But Christ has redeemed us. And put his spirit in us and is reforming us into the image of Jesus. And sometimes God is gentle, pours the spirit, water of the spirit on our lives, smooths us out. And we love that. We love those times of worship where it's like, oh, thank you, Lord. You've shaped me. You've, you've built me up again. There's that nice smoothing. Other times he breaks bit, bits off and it's like, that hurts. Why have I had to leave that behind, Lord? Because it's not like Jesus taking it off. Other times, he picks us up, and like a good old potter, he slams us back down on that wheel and says, come on, let's start again. Some, t- some of us maybe have been slammed onto that potter's wheel. And it's like, come on, let's get you remoulded, reshaped. But God in his goodness knows what he's doing. Ephesians four seventeen to 24 says this, So I say this and insist in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do. The Gentiles are those outside of Christ. So don't live like them in the futility, in the wastefulness of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts. Again, it's that hardness of heart that all humans are susceptible to, the hardness to God. Because they are callous, They have given themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn about Christ like this. If indeed you heard about him and were taught in him just as the truth is in Jesus. You were taught with reverence to your former way of life to lay aside the old man 
who is being corrupted in accordance with deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new man who has been created in God's image in righteousness and holiness that comes from truth. And in there is, is choice. We need to put on the new man or the new woman. We need to put on Christ and make choices. It doesn't just happen. We don't just become like Jesus by saying, Lord, change me. We need to do our discipline. We need to read our words. We need to pray. We need to worship. We need to repent. We need to renounce things and say, Lord, that's not your way of thinking. I'm going to think your way. And it's by the renewing of our minds that we're transformed, changing the way that we think, the attitudes, the responses to be more Christ-like. And God calls us in that to be the light of the world and salt in the earth, to shine his brightness into the world. And Paul goes on to write in, in 2 Corinthians 5, all this is from God, the new creation, all this is from God who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This was all in God's plan, his merciful and gracious plan, that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I think we read that and, and let it bounce off us, but we might have thought we were a little bit all right before Jesus, and that, yeah, I needed a bit of saving, but we needed total saving. Everything about us was lost. Everything about us could not get us to God. But in his mercy, Jesus died whilst we were still sinners. Whilst we were still enemies of God, Jesus died for the ungodly, that he would rescue us. That me, Mark Savage, who rebelled against God, who mocked Christians, now stands before you reconciled to God and with a message of reconciliation because of the goodness and the mercy of Jesus. Not a single one of us deserved it, but we got it. It's a free gift. And this message of re re reconciliation that we've been entrusted with, how would God trust us? Even when we're first saved, how would he entrust us with this message of reconciliation? Because he does. Just because he does. Don't know why, don't know how, but each one of us has been given this ministry of reconciliation with a message of reconciliation, which is the gospel. The gospel has saved us, and we now are called to be ministers of that gospel. Absolutely every single one of us. And there's been an injustice in the church where that's been taken away from everybody and put in the hands of the priests or the vicars or the ministers or the evangelists. But oh, each one of us, as believers in Jesus, as disciples of Jesus, as ambassadors of Jesus, have been given the ministry of sharing the gospel with others. Not just through doing nice things, but by speaking it, by sharing it. And there's this phrase that goes around, and it's attributed to Francis of Assisi, but he never said it. It's not true. It says, um, um, where you can and if, um, when you can, share the gospel, and if possible, use words. Something along those lines. So it's like, yeah, d do nice things, and if possible, say something. But he never said that. He went around proclaiming the gospel, and like Jesus, he demonstrated it. But he never just did nice things and tidied people's gardens and and gave, made meals for people without saying, actually, this is because Jesus loves you. And so as Christians, we can't hide behind good works. We have to step into them and proclaim with our voices the message of reconciliation. Jesus is the only way. And it pains me to see sometimes where, where Christians have joint prayer meetings with other faiths. I don't get it. What does light have to do with darkness? What does Jesus have to do with Baal, the demonic? How can you have a prayer meeting where actually let's get the Muslims in, let's get the Buddhists and we're all going to, let's um, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. What a lot of rubbish. It's demonic. It's ungodly. There's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. And people need to know that. People are going down paths that are going to lead them to eternal death. And we're too shy or reticent to say that will lead to death. That's not a true religion. That's fake. There's only one way to the Father. It's Jesus. How do we know that? Because Jesus said it. 
and he's not a liar. And we, we bless those who are of other faiths, but they need Jesus. They need saving. They need rescuing from a path that leads to destruction. And God is so loving and kind that he brings enemies back. He brought us back. He's appearing to Muslims in dreams and saying about, telling them about salvation. And they're coming to faith in their droves. There's the fastest growing church in the world is in Iran. Underneath the surface, people getting saved and sharing the gospel. And they're turning to faith and they're actually turning towards Israel in love. Where they hated Israel, they're now turning in love. Because God is changing their hearts. This is what God is like. He's loving, he's generous, he's kind, he's faithful. And this is what we've got to tell people. God loves you. God doesn't hate you. God hates nobody, but he hates sin. And we'll be judged in our sins and we'll be judged in our rebellion. But he loves the whole world. That's the scripture that we can all turn back to. For God so loved the world, not just the chosen, not just Israel. He loves everybody. He loves the worst of sinners, of which Paul said, I am that. And Paul goes on in 2 Corinthians, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. Making, God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's what we need to implore people to get reconciled with God. Give your life to Jesus. Jesus is the only one that can forgive sins. And set us on, onto the path of life and redemption and holiness. And we have been given that daunting and amazing privilege of being the ministers of that gospel. And in Isaiah 61, if you want to turn there, Isaiah 61, it's, this is what Jesus claimed about himself. He was this, um, they call it the, the Isaiahic servant. Servant of suffering that is presented in Isaiah as the one to come. And this was a, a verse that was seen as going to be upon the, the, this, mess, this messianic servant, the one who is represented in Isaiah. And Jesus claimed the scroll for himself. He said, this is me. And he said that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. And that was upon Jesus, and that's what he did. But it's now upon us. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon you to do the things in Isaiah 61, to set people free, to bind up the broken heart, to bring good news to the poor, whether that's physically poor or spiritually poor, that we actually are a planet of the display for God's splendour, for his own glory, and that we get to rebuild the ancient ruins of the world around us, that we are the redeemers, we are the rebuilders, the restorers, because the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon us. So next time you read Isaiah 61, read it for Jesus and read it for yourself. That's on you, because you've got the spirit of the sovereign Lord upon you and how we act and what we do with what God has given us, what he, we do with the spirit that is upon our lives has an eternal impact on others. Your life has an eternal impact on those around you. What are you doing with what God has given you? The message is to be reconciled to Jesus, to turn from your sins and be saved. In Acts 17, we read about Paul going to Athens and he, we know that he was an ambassador for Christ. He claimed that by himself. And it says in Acts 17 that Paul, he was standing in the midst of the Areopagus and he said to the people there, men of, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. The grace of God is, is not far from anybody on the face of the planet. For it says, in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And so Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so you see there the boldness of Paul, but the truth is not being controversial, he's not bashing them for being idiots. He's saying, look, you're searching for God, I can tell you what he's like. I can show you who he is and what he's done. And we see there that some come to faith, some mock, some are not going to turn to Jesus. A lot of them mock him, but some come to faith. And one of them is even named, so in the day it's like, look, this guy you might have heard of, he actually heard, heard Paul and became a Christian. And Paul later writes to the church in Rome, he says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on, in, on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As is it, it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So anyone who turns their ear to the gospel and turns to Jesus will be saved, guaranteed. There's no ifs or buts. If they turn and repent, they're saved. As simple as that. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they going to be saved if they don't hear? How are they going to be saved if they don't hear what the gospel is? Because it says there that faith comes by hearing the word of God, which is the gospel. They get faith through hearing the word of God. There are some stories where God turns up in his spiritual power and people are saved in the fields, like during the Hebridean revival, just convicted of the sins and knew that God was there and they turn. But the vast majority of the time, and the bog standard is that they need someone to tell them who Christ is and what he's done. How are they meant to turn to Christ if they've not heard about him? Some will say no, but others will say yes. And Paul, again, later in Romans says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. We can be ashamed of the gospel if we're not careful, we could be a bit embarrassed and not want to be rejected. Danny? Yeah. 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 yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, the Bible does teach that that so the question was about what what do we do about those who don't here in the jungle, say dis- distant tribes. And the Bible teaches that actually it's about God looking at the heart. And there's some who it's in Romans where at the start of Romans where some you know, they've not heard the gospel but they've responded to the work of the Spirit somehow, that God is working in all people. And there's something in them that God recognises as faith and as salvation. God's grace is far bigger than how we box it in. God's grace is, is, is amazing. It saved us, it rescued us. So I would say there's going to be some tribes in heaven, you know, every tribe and tongue it says, isn't it? So who knows? Just because we haven't got there doesn't mean that God's going to punish them. Will confess, yeah, and, and and of every tribe and tongue in, in being seen in heaven, and so there's yeah, God's grace is is amazing, and that's what we are ministers of. We are ministers of God's grace, and we shouldn't lose heart. There's a battle over people's hearts and minds. We we see it; it's intensifying. I really felt during COVID that there was a a real squeezing going on in, in the spirit realm. That there was something going on where God was working to squeeze our lives, but the enemy was also squeezing, wanting to throttle life. And then out of nowhere, really, we get all this transgender stuff, we get all, all this left-wing stuff that comes out of COVID, a lot of it, because there's a squeezing. But also, God is squeezing his church to respond, to be like him, to be merciful, to be loving, to be kind, to be generous, but also to be truthful. There's a squeezing on truth. What is truth? It's what God says it is. And we love Jesus and we love others. We're called to love the world, not to condemn it. That's not our job. We're called to reach people, to love people. And I long for the day where we have people in, in our church who are not like us, who might not be living lifestyles that we approve of, but we get the chance to love and to lead to Jesus and to journey with them into truth and freedom and life instead of just being a little bit of a monog- monogamous group, aren't we really? Is that the right sort of word? Mo- mono- monogynous group, that's probably not a monogamous. <laughs> monogynous, we're all the same really, aren't we? Generally. Homogenous, that's it. Homogenous. <laughs> I think I invented a word, mon- monogynous. I claim that trademark. But that's what the church needs to be. Yeah, we are for truth. We are for holiness. But others need to come in and experience that. And it's only through love and relationship and journeying patiently with people that we lead them into the freedom that Christ died for them for. We don't keep them at arm's length. We invite them in. And there's, there's that image of this. Uh, we're a circle, aren't we? As opposed to being like a boundary. Yeah, no, you can't come in unless you're like this. Actually, all are welcome. But it doesn't mean we accept everybody as they are. We welcome everybody and we want to love people. Otherwise, we kind of think we're, we're better than others. We're not. We've all got messes in our lives that Jesus is working on gracefully. And so we don't get religious and say, no, actually they're out. No, they're in until God says they're out. Let's love them. And then it says, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, what does that mean? It means that actually outside of Jesus we, we're going to get punished. Because God is holy, he's just, and he, will, he has to punish sin, otherwise he's not holy. Things aren't right in the world and in the universe if, if something that is rebellious isn't corrected and has a judgment upon it. But Christ became our judgment. Christ became, for us, the object of God's wrath. It's unpopular that in a lot of circles of Christianity today that actually, is God wrathful or is he just loving? He's both. Wrath is an expression of his love. God is love, so he's lovingly wrathful. He's, he lo- yeah, he lovingly disciplines us because he loves us. But at the end, we like to think that someone like Hitler who, and Jimmy Savile, who kind of got away in this life, that one day they're actually going to get the comeuppance. They deserve something in the eternal because of, of the evil. They didn't turn to Jesus. They, they were sinful and are condemned. And there's something that gives us hope in that actually that People either turn to Jesus or those that hurt others and destroy lives one day are going to get justice from the one who judges justly. That's what the Bible says. Actually, we hand them over to God. Say, God, we trust in you that actually that's going to be sorted and that people don't get away with living at the expense of others. 
and it says, just to kind of close on that bit, you know, for our sake, Jesus, who knew no sin, no sin became our sin. So it's judged on the cross. We are forgiven, we are cleansed, we are free. We get to live in righteousness. And righteousness is not just a position that we have before God, a right standing. It's also a way that we live our lives. And righteousness lived under God in this world has power. It's got power to transform, to impact the world around us. Righteousness is the manifestation of God's character in and through our lives. So our righteousness is not just, yeah, I'm righteous in Christ, but I live like a moron. It's I'm righteous in Christ and I get to live like him. And that's for all of us, that we actually live for Jesus and like Jesus. It's transformative. It brings light into the darkness. It brings hope where there's no hope. It restores what is broken and it rebuilds a broken world with the gospel in the power of the spirit demonstrating the kingdom that is to come. We are like the first fruits of what is to come. God is coming back. Jesus is going to set up his kingdom and we are get to demonstrate that kingdom in the here and now. 1 John 1 says this, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all, all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So we're ministers of reconciliation because we've been reconciled to God. And he trusts us through the spirit, through the word of God to represent Jesus and to share this ministry of reconciliation with the world. But we're also called to do that effectively by being the righteousness of God. And forgiveness... It's free, but it's conditional. It's not just like, yeah, no, you're forgiven of whatever you do again. That's just not true. Because it says there, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's not about salvation. That's about how much you're becoming like Jesus in this time. How are you representing Jesus? Or are you still walking in areas of your life where there's darkness? We're called to walk in the light as he is in the light or do we allow darkness in our lives do we have shadows in our lives that we're letting sin take root are we opening doors up that we shouldn't open and I believe that there's people here who have opened doors in their lives and you've been praying for God to shut that door but God is telling you to shut that door that you've got to cut things off you've got to say no to things you've got to resist the devil so that he can flee and when you shut that door, God will help you keep it locked. But he's looking at you saying, you do it. Stop looking to me. You make choices. You pick up your cross and you die to self. Shut that door and I'll keep it shut. Are we living righteous, righteously? Or are we letting paths into our lives that lead us to prisons? Have we got gateways still for the enemy to come into our lives? The enemy loves to hang around rubbish, where there's unconfessed sin, where there's things in our life that we entertain that aren't, aren't godly. He's the Lord of the flies for a reason. He's the devil. He hangs around rubbish and mess and death. And he fuels things. The enemy fuels the sin of our lives to make it a bonfire. When actually Jesus says, walk in the light, confess your sins. And there's things in my life that had power until I confessed them to people. And things in my life that I still need to keep bringing to God and trying to walk in the light. Don't do it always. Don't get it right a lot of the time. But I'm getting better. And I want to be righteous, not only before God, but with God. And represent him to the world more and more effectively. 
I'm going to look more next year on that. You know, what, what is deliverance? Why do we need to be people of prayer, but also areas in our lives that might need deliverance, which is getting the enemy off our backs, basically. Getting him out of our lives, orchestrating, pulling some of the strings. And we are gods, we belong to him. But it doesn't mean that the enemy hasn't got a foothold. Ephesians 4 says, in your anger do not sin, do not give the enemy a foothold. And that word foothold means territory. It can be areas of our lives where we entertain the devil. Where we let the demonic affect the way that we think and the choices that we make. And So next year we're going to explore that a bit more because I really believe that we're getting to a time where the Lord is squeezing, like I said, the church. And that means that things are going to get, come up in our lives that need getting out or getting off. Psalm 51 says this. If Gary can come up, Gary's just going to tinkle on the um, keyboard as we just wait for the Spirit and let the Spirit do what he wants to do this morning. This is a psalm of David. He says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your works and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in, 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 in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. You see there the redemption that comes through that. That actually, sorting our hearts out with the Lord allows us then to be a greater witness and people will return to the Lord because they see our lives. They don't see our hypocrisy. They don't see the words of our lips but denying it by our lifestyle. We actually match our words and it has greater power. We're called to be witnesses. Jesus was the greatest witness ever because he was without sin. And we'll never be without sin, really. But we can be increasingly free from it. And increasingly Christ-like in our words and in our actions. And I really believe that the law today, through the Spirit, has been impressing upon people areas just where actually you want to get that cleansing. Get that refreshing by the Holy Spirit. And just as Gary plays, I just invite you all to stand. I'm just going to pray and just hear from the Lord and just to pray for people. So just Gary, the worship band can stay just out at the moment, if that's all right. And so where in your life do you need that greater freedom? Where in your life do you maybe recognise that the enemy's had a bit of a field day? He's taught you some lies that you've believed or you've opened some doors when you heard a knocking and it's not God. And you need to shut that door. Close that door. God's got the lock and the key but the handle's on your side. You need to say no to that. Things in our lives that we entertain that the Bible's clear at that you don't. But God calls us to be a holy people, to be a righteous representative of him with the great uh, message of reconciliation. And so Holy Spirit, will you come and just touch hearts? Come and remind people of your great love, of your great mercy. God, that you don't come with a, a wagging finger, you don't come with a stick 
to beat us. But just like the son in the prodigal son story, you come with open arms to embrace and to love. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance. And so just in your heart now, just be giving back to the Lord things that he's not asked you to have. Close those doors in your heart and be determined to close them and keep it shut with the Lord. The promise is freedom. The promise is life and life in its fullness. The promise is a more effective witness for Jesus because the Spirit will speak in and through you because the junk is out of the way. So much clutter, so much nonsense, but the Spirit of the God is gracious. He's faithful, He's kind. And so Holy Spirit, I ask you just to, to minister to hearts and to bring a fresh cleansing, a fresh release, a fresh joy of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, giving each of us a, a determination to be your ambassadors, to share your love with others, to share your mercy and your grace, but also the truth of salvation with others. We're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father apart from through you. You are life. You are resurrection. And in the life to come, in eternity, God, you are the way and the truth to resurrect our bodies and give us eternal life in the kingdom of God forever and ever. And so, Lord, we lay our hearts before you afresh. We lay our minds before you, our hands, our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you, for that is our worthwhile act of worship for what you've done for us. We say no to the devil. We say yes to Jesus. Amen.